Well, hello. Uh, I'm Father Nick, the priest and pastor of the Fort Church of St. Martin's Parish. Uh, and I have with me the Reverend Dr. Ross Wright. Uh, and uh, this is our first discussion on uh, how did we get the New Testament. Uh, and so uh, we're going to be leading a series of classes on Zoom uh, throughout uh, the autumn uh, where we'll be talking about how we got the New Testament. Uh, and we're producing these videos in a in advance uh, so that uh, we can lead the discussions um, when we meet via Zoom with, with our parishioners. Uh, but uh, before we get started, um, Ross, would you like to, uh, to read uh, the collect? Sure. Um, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That uh, seems to me to be a particularly appropriate collect from the Book of Common Prayer to uh, begin our discussion uh, of, of the New Testament uh, in particular and Scripture in general. Uh, so thank you for reading that, Ross. Pleasure. Um, so uh, the overall course is um, how did we get the New Testament? Uh, and uh, this specific, um, what we're particularly talking about uh, in this video is uh, the New Testament and its world. Uh, so just what is the New Testament is, is kind of what I thought we, we would start with. Um, and uh, and I, I'm going to start really basic, probably too basic, uh, but just stick with us for, um, for a few minutes while we cover the very basic uh, info, and then we'll move into stuff that's uh, a little bit more advanced and a little bit more interesting, I think. Um, but uh, the first question I think we should we should ask and, and answer is uh, where where can you find the New Testament? And you can find the New Testament in your Bible, towards the back of your Bible. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, it, it's maybe about a, a quarter of the Bible, maybe maybe even less than that. What, what, what would you say, Ross? Maybe, maybe a little less than a quarter? Yeah, a little less, yeah. Yeah, toward, towards the end of the Bible. Um, it's the last 27 books. Um, and uh, so these are uh, the 27 books uh, that were canonized by the church. They were made our scriptural canon uh, as part of this larger canon of scripture that includes the Old Testament also. Uh, and so you might be asking, well, what, what, is, what is a canon? And canon is, uh, comes from a Greek word, uh, and the Greek word means uh, rule or measure. So, so you can think of like a ruler or measuring stick. Um, and so uh, these are the, um, what we might say are the, uh, the full measure of inspired and faithful witness by which uh, all other witnesses are measured or, or judged. These 27 books, in addition to the, to the books of the Old Testament that make up the the whole canon of scripture. Uh, they are for the church the reliable and faithful witness of scripture to the new covenant in Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Uh, and so that, that also tells us something that um, we need to know, which is New Testament is, is, is a, a slightly more archaic way of saying new covenant. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we're talking about, the, 
the covenant established in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so the purpose of this class is to ask the questions, who wrote these books, these 27 books, when and where were they written, uh, why and to whom were they written, uh, and how did they become the canon of the New Testament? Uh, that's, these are the kinds of questions we're going to address as we move through uh, this, uh, in a sense, survey of the New Testament. Um, and uh, finally, I, I have a warning that I, I'd like to give, and, and that's, uh, in a sense, you're, you're about to see how the sausage gets made. Uh, and um, what I mean by that is uh, by looking into these questions, and instead of doing a particular Bible study uh, of a particular book of the New Testament, but, but asking the kinds of questions of who, who wrote it, to whom, when, um, these, these questions are going to kind of take us outside of the text in a way. Uh, and so we'll be looking at it uh, from a distance. It'll become, in that sense, an object of study for us, which is different than the way we usually approach scripture in the church and, and even in uh, Bible studies, where uh, we don't treat scripture as an object to be uh, examined, but uh, as a living voice, uh, as the word of God uh, that has a call upon us and, and upon our lives. Uh, and so <clears throat> it, what I think of is uh, I, I studied religion as an undergrad. I, I then, you know, went on to seminary. Uh, obviously, um, Ross also has has had that kind of education. And what I noticed is uh, both in college as an undergraduate and, and then even in seminary, uh, is that when we would take these, <clears throat> these uh, classes on the New Testament and the Old Testament, and we saw how the sausage gets made. We, we got the, the history of how these texts got written and put together and became a canon. <clears throat> It often invited the students, even the seminary students, to, to take and maintain this position of uh, kind of an objective scrutinizer of scripture as if scripture is a, uh, a cadaver laying on a table and you're dissecting it. Um, and, and that, when you do that, you can no longer hear the living voice of God in the text. Uh, it, it can no longer be for you the word of God if that's the position you always maintain towards it. Uh, and I think it's really difficult to break out of that once you get into that perspective. Um, and, and so my, my warning is uh, that never treat the New Testament or scripture in that way as a cadaver. We might have to step outside for a minute to ask these certain questions, but never forget that this is the inspired uh, word of God for us. I mean, it's, it's for you. God is, is giving himself to you through this text, through these words. That's Holding on to that, I think, is important. Um, Ross, what do you think about that? I mean, did you have a similar experience? Uh, with these texts or do you have a, a way of, of approaching them that might help us? Yeah, I think it's a really helpful warning, um, Nick, that, uh, and I'll particularly like your image of, um, or both the images of not treating the scripture as a cadaver and also the image of uh, looking at how the sausage is made. Um, one way to, to frame this concern, if I, if I may slightly paraphrase what you're saying is um, the question, how, how can we, pay attention to the human side of scripture uh, without losing sight of the divine side. And I like to think of the scriptures on the analogy of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The incarnation teaches us that, that the Lord Jesus is fully human and at the same time fully divine, a mystery that we can't explain, but which we, uh, we hold as the center of Christian faith. And at a similar, in a similar way, though, at a, at a lower level, 
um, I think it's helpful to think of the scriptures as fully human and fully divine. In the context in which we normally experience the scriptures in Sunday morning worship, we tend to emphasize the divine side of scripture. At the end of the reading, um, the reader will say the word of the Lord and we will say thanks be to God. We uh, hear them in the context of a worship service. And um, so we tend to emphasize the, this side of the scriptures as the, um, the vehicle or the, the, the vessel through which we hear God's voice, we experience God's presence. <clears throat> And this emphasis on the divine side is wholly and completely uh, appropriate and acceptable. At the same time, we can learn a lot by paying attention to the human side of scripture, how the sausage is made, to use Nick's uh, phrase. And if I could just continue the analogy, um, in the same way that we learn a lot about Jesus by paying attention to the human conditions of his birth, say, to the relationships between Mary and Joseph or the cultural conditions that existed when Jesus was born. Um, these things illuminate and, and clarify aspects of who Jesus is for us. In the same way, the human dimension of scripture can also open all kinds of doors. Um, the scriptures were, after all, written by human beings with foibles and frailties, just like the rest of us. Uh, in many cases, the writers of scripture didn't think of themselves as writing scripture. Um, they were pastors like Paul, writing specific letters to congregations of people they loved, uh, answering specific questions. And it was only later that the church came to recognize their writings as canonical scripture. So in the course, um, as Nick has mentioned, we're going to be asking some of the questions uh, about the human dimension. Who were the authors? Um, why did they write the epistles and the gospels? What literary forms did they use? Um, what were some of the cultural, linguistic, historical, and sociological factors um, that went into the writing of scriptures? But just to reiterate what Nick has said, the purpose of all this is um, to deepen our appreciation of, of the Bible, of the New Testament, as God's living word. And so my hope is that uh, as the uh, as our semester continues, that we will be able to ask some questions that maybe have puzzled us about the scriptures um, and uh, learn more about the human dimension, but always with the purpose of deepening our discipleship and our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that, that's great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that image of, um, of the incarnation and, and using that as an analogy for, for how we approach scripture is, is uh, really fruitful uh, because on, on the one hand, um, you know, there's, it's, it's just through uh, Jesus's humanity that we come to know his divinity. Um, and, and the, the two, though they're not mixed uh, as, as uh, the Chalcedonian formula says, uh, but they're also inseparable. And I, I think that's, that's also true uh, in a sense for, for scripture. And I, I think I noticed that um, maybe you were um, hinting at or, 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 or drawing on Luther's, uh, Martin Luther's image uh, for scripture. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I love that image. Um, and I hope I'm accurately presenting Luther's ideas. I haven't actually read Luther on this for a while, but it's basically the idea that, um, that Jesus, uh, the divine son of God, was born in a manger, which is a very human, humble uh, piece of equipment or furniture or whatever it was. Um, and likewise, the scriptures, um, uh, Luther often compared the scriptures to the manger in which uh, is cradled the Lord Jesus Christ for us. And I think that's a, a really helpful, helpful image. Yeah, and 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 again, it reminds us that um, that we should never forget that that Scripture is this living voice of God. It, it's it it is the means by which we receive the Word of God. Um, in in that sense, also like the Eucharist, you know, we, Christ actually gives Himself to us in the Eucharist. Christ gives Himself to us 
uh, in the gospel, uh, and I, I use gospel in, in the more expansive sense, uh, you know, any, any part of scripture where, that we hear as good news for us, uh, we are, we're actually receiving Christ uh, through those words, those human words, just like these human, uh, these elements of, of human manufacture, you know, the, the bread being made from the grain of the earth and the wine being uh, made from by human hands from from the grapes of the earth, uh, yet convey to us Jesus Christ. And same with these words of Scripture, uh, written by human hands, uh, articulated uh, by human minds, and yet they give to us uh, Jesus Christ, who is the very Word of God. Um, yeah, if I could just add one, one final example, a concrete example of how understanding the human dimension leads us to a, a deeper understanding of, of the divine side. Um, you've probably noticed in your reading of scripture um, that there are these different emphases um, that come through. Um, for example, the Apostle Paul's understanding of the law um, sometimes sounds different to us than, say, Matthew's, the Gospel of Matthew's emphasis on the law, um, or St. Paul on faith and works often sounds uh, to be in contrast with um, the Epistle of James. And I used to be very bothered by this and, and sort of exercised by it, and I would spend a lot of time trying to harmonize Paul with, um, with Matthew or with James. And I think if we remember that these were human documents written to human communities and they had different concerns, um, then it, it takes the pressure off of having to try to forcibly harmonize things. We can, let, we can let Paul be Paul on the law. And even within various epistles of Paul, he has slightly different emphases depending on his audience. And we can let James be James rather than um, nervously trying to, to create this, um, um, kind of harmonization that is um, imposed upon it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's one of the advantages to me of, of um, emphasizing the human size. It helps us relax a bit on some of the differences and some of the puzzling aspects of scripture while we can still maintain a very high view of, of the authority of scripture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because I was actually in a, uh, a webinar last week um, where uh, Amy Jill Levine, a uh, New Testament scholar at, um, at Vanderbilt, was presenting on the Sermon on the Mount. She's got a new book out on the Sermon on, on the Mount. And, uh, and I, I especially like her work because she's Jewish. So she's a Jewish New Testament scholar. It brings fresh eyes, uh, in a sense, to these texts. Um, and uh, in that webinar, there was a time for questions and answers. And I actually asked her, because she was talking about uh, Matthew's gospel where the Sermon on the Mount is found, uh, I asked her, what is Matthew's view of the law and uh, dikaiosune, justice or righteousness and justification, uh, as opposed to Paul? Uh, do, they have, do they have different views of this? And if so, which one is closer to Jesus? Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I was, I was interested to hear what she would say about this. Uh, and actually, her response was very similar to yours, Ross. She said, well, they definitely have different things to say about these topics. She said, but, but not necessarily mutually exclusive or antagonistic things to say on, on these important theological issues. Uh, and she said, and I think they're both equally close to Jesus's own teachings on it. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's almost exactly what, what I hear you saying there. The other thing is uh, what you bring up is that uh, these 27 books are written by different authors uh, in different contexts. Now, some of them, in fact, a good, a good chunk of them are written, by, for example, by St. Paul. But uh, so, so some of them share an author, but, but there are also uh, others are written by very different authors who have very different communities that they're writing to. Uh, 
they both uh, have a share, or they all have a shared cultural context, which is the Roman Empire, but they, they uh, at the same time have um, distinct cultural contexts and communities that they're writing to. Uh, I wonder if, uh, Ross, you could say something about uh, the more general uh, cultural context of the New Testament, the world of the New Testament. Sure, be glad to. Well, um, let me begin just with the very basic facts, which all of you know, but it's just helpful to be reminded of. Um, first, that the New Testament was written by Jews um, to a largely Jewish audience. Um, they were Jewish followers of Jesus, and the writers of the New Testament had as their target audience um, other Jews, and in some cases, what are referred to as God-fearers. Nick talked about this in his Romans uh, expositions on Sunday. These were people who were not Jews, but who attached themselves to the Jewish synagogue and, and adopted Jewish beliefs. Um, now, I think it's important to remember that Judaism then as now was a highly complex uh, religious uh, world. There were all kinds of layers and levels and facets to Judaism. Uh, for example, the type of Judaism that you experienced depended to some extent on where you lived. If you lived in Palestine, in Jerusalem, so-called um, a particular tradition, um, there was a Palestinian Judaism, there were certain givens. If you lived in the diaspora, um, which is outside of Jerusalem, there were some other cultural factors. And even within the same geographic region, there were different sects or traditions. And so we're familiar with Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots and Essenes. So um, when we say Judaism or Jewishness, it's important to remember that this is a very complex, variegated, uh, religious tradition, not not one single um, entity or single tradition. Yeah, I'm, I might jump in if if you don't mind for Please, a second. Yeah. And uh, this this has been really uh, important in New Testament scholarship uh, in really in the 20th century, um, especially after uh, the Holocaust. Uh, you know the the atrocities committed by the Nazis in Germany. Uh, the, the New Testament scholarship looked back and saw that that there had been a um, tradition in German New Testament scholarship, which was really the vanguard of New Testament scholarship, that downplayed Jesus's Jewishness, and in in some cases even tried to suggest that he wasn't a Jew or or, or part of Judaism, uh, and which is just, I mean, plainly false, right? Uh, but uh, in the wake of uh, the Holocaust and World War II, New Testament scholarship really uh, took a hard look at itself and said, we, we need to take more seriously Jesus's Jewishness and the Jewishness of the New Testament, and, and has uh, really done that. But um, there are ways that, that, that it can be done well, and there are ways that it's, it's not done well. And one of the ways that it's not done well is to just take modern Judaism, as you might find it in the United States or even in Israel, and project that back onto Jesus and Paul in the New Testament. It's a very different kind of Judaism. We're talking about 2,000 years of difference. And even uh, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, which many scholars will still use to try and understand the Judaism of the first century, the Babylonian Talmud wasn't uh, finished being compiled and, and actually published, you might say, as, 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 a, as a complete text until 500 AD, so, so nearly 500 years after the time of Jesus. So we have to be careful not to take the Judaisms that we know uh, and try and project them back onto the Judaism of Jesus' time, which was very different, if for no other reason, because the, Judaisms of, the Judaism of Jesus' day, unlike the Judaism of uh, the time after the New Testament, was centered around the temple in Jerusalem. But that temple was destroyed in the first century uh, 
at the time that many of the New Testament texts were being written. And Judaism, after the destruction of the temple, becomes something different. It has to. It has to grow. It has to change. God takes Judaism in a, in a new direction. He leads his people, Israel, in a new direction after that, uh, just as he leads the church in a new direction after that. Uh, and so we, we don't want to project modern Judaism or even medieval Judaism back onto the Judaism of, of Jesus's day. We also don't want to assume that the Old Testament represents the Judaism as practiced in the time of Jesus. Uh, there's, there's an even longer gulf between some of those Old Testament texts uh, historically and the time of Jesus. And, and to just assume that at the time of Jesus, every Jew was following the Old Testament as if that was written yes, you know, yesterday for them or handed down by Moses to them you know, just the day before is, is uh, an incorrect way of approaching it. We, we have to be more careful in talking about the Judaism of Jesus' time. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a, on a tangent. No, but, that's um, really helpful. Yeah, thanks. Well, so that's, that's the first kind of obvious fact about the New Testament documents is they were written by Jewish authors to a largely Jewish audience. And, and the second sort of obvious fact, but it bears um, repeating at this point, is that the New Testament was written uh, at a time when Israel was under Roman occupation. It was part of the Roman Empire. And the New Testament was also written in Greek, the Greek language, because of the influence of um, what is often referred to as Hellenism, Greek culture, Greek philosophy, Greek language. Um, and so these facts that I just mentioned give us three traditions or three um, uh, co contextual factors to keep in mind as we consider um, the writing of the New Testament. Uh, the first is Judaism, and we've uh, identified that. Uh, the second is Hellenistic culture, so Greek philosophy and religion and language. And then the third is Roman culture, um, which uh, had was important for political reasons. There were also Roman philosophers and um, somewhat less influence at the kind of level of ideas and concepts, but nevertheless influential still. So um, one way to just make this concrete and easy to remember is to think about one person, namely the Apostle Paul. What kind of person was Paul? Well, Paul was a Jew, uh, specifically a, a Pharisee. And you'll remember that in Philippians 3, he's uh, as a believer now in Christ, talking about his uh, sort of Jewish credentials, so to speak. And he says, um, uh, if anyone has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have far more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So Paul is basically kind of trotting out his his Jewish bona fides there, or credentials. Um, Paul was also um, Hellenistic. He was born in Tarsus. He was born in a, what is known as the diaspora, so outside of Jerusalem. And from what we can tell, his primary language or his first language was Greek. Um, and so as a Hellenist, a Hellenized Jew, he would have walked past Greek temples um, as he made his way throughout his daily business. He would have uh, passed by groups of Stoic philosophers or Epicurean philosophers who gathered uh, on the streets for their uh, bull sessions and uh, um, colloquies about philosophical ideas. Um, so these were the kind of Hellenistic influences that Paul would have experienced. And then thirdly, he was a Roman citizen. Um, influenced by the Roman political organization and Roman ideas. So those are the three uh, cultural strands that go into to making up Paul. And these three elements, Judaism, uh, Hellenization, or Greek culture, and Roman culture were all sort of intermingled and intertwined. They, weren't, they didn't exist as separate um, uh, categories. They were intermingled and, and intermixed. Um, one last thing I'll mention, and I'll just kind of file this by title, and, and we can pick it up in um, uh, in weeks to come. Or Nick may want to say a bit about um, about this now. 
there were some features of Mediterranean culture um, that applied to this part of the world in general that we're talking about, um, kind of across the various traditions, Jewish traditions, Hellenistic traditions, and Roman traditions. Um, one aspect was it was a culture of honor and shame, honor and shame. Um, and I want to read to you just a brief sentence or two from a book on the Apostle Paul. It's a book that I use when I'm teaching at Randolph-Macon. Um, one writer defines honor and shame in a culture as um, a claim to worth on the part of an individual family or group. What makes me worthy? And again, to harken back to Nick's if, uh, Romans uh, expositions, there was a lot about that um, in the Romans text about you know, where, from where does honor come? So honor lies um, in two parts. One is internal and one is external. Honor is the value of a person in his or her own eyes. But then also there's um, the value assigned to a person from the outside based on economic status or cultural status, you know, whatever. So honor and shame is very important in this culture and we'll see this coming up in, um, in the text that we'll be looking at. A uh, second factor was patron-client relations. So this is a really a sociological category or economic category. Um, we're living in a culture or we're talking about a culture that is um, long before capitalism or anything approaching it. And so wealth was concentrated often in a few people. Um, and so in order for things to work financially, often a, a, a patron would take on a client. And so um, as we read the letters, pay attention, for example, to how Paul, um, their the client patron dynamics going on in some of Paul's letters. And then thirdly, just some of the realities of the Greco-Roman city. Um, you know, what it was like, what the agora was like, the marketplace, how people lived really crowded, uh, close together. Um, these are some of the factors that just made up the cultural, political, uh, economic life um, of the Mediterranean basin. Yeah. Nick, over to you. Sure. Uh, I, I think what, one thing that, that Ross and I are, are, are experiencing is uh, we, we want to we keep these videos uh, relatively short so so that uh people actually watch them <laughs> but 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 there's so much to say and and uh and it's it's important to get some of this content out but but you also feel like there's so much more i could say about uh these things and i, I think that's probably true with any of those um categories uh, cultural categories that, that ross was just um going through there's so much that we could say about them and examples we could give we just don't have the time but but i do want to pick up and maybe kind of that's that's more of a zoomed in view and i, I kind of want to perhaps uh zoom out for a second uh and then then we may need to just go ahead and wrap things up um but i want to talk about the the roman empire for a second because uh despite the fact that different books are written in different places within the Roman Empire and and there there's gonna so there's cultural dif differences encoded in the books based on where and to whom they're written and by whom they're written um, they all share this this larger uh, context of the Roman Empire Israel at that time uh, was a province of the Roman Empire province meant that uh, it was governed by it was part of the empire but but the uh folks there were not actually citizens of the empire so uh they didn't have any of the rights and privileges of of citizens uh but uh other folks like paul was a citizen of of the roman empire because he wasn't a uh what we would might call a homeland jew uh he wasn't living he wasn't born and raised within the province uh, of of Israel, what would later the Romans would call uh, Syria, Palestina, but um, I want to take for a second the, the kind of wider view of what 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 was the Roman Empire, since that's the cultural context. And one thing that we need to talk about then is just what's an empire. I mean, it's it's a word that we use, but um, maybe not one that we unpack very often. Uh, and we use it in different contexts for different types of nations and political organizations and history that are sometimes very different from one another. Uh, 
when we're talking about the Roman Empire, ancient empires in general, what we're talking about uh, are uh, these uh, massive geopolitical um, organizations um, that are centered in a capital city. And cities are what, what's important, which, uh, which Ross has already kind of brought up. Uh, cities are important. Uh, they're more important that, you know, we have this notion of nations being bounded in by um, uh, boundaries uh, that, that are kind of arbitrary, that you wouldn't know necessarily unless you were looking at a map. Uh, that's not the way that ancient people thought uh, in terms of their uh, political, uh, geopolitical kind of uh, institutions. Uh, they thought in terms, especially in, in the Hellenistic world, in the Roman world, uh, about city-states, uh, as, as Ross has already kind of mentioned. And so Rome was the center, the center city-state, the, the, uh, the you know, capital of this Roman Empire, and they would go out and conquer cities and any time you conquered a city, uh, or any you know any city that became part of the Roman Empire, what came along with it were the hinterlands, the agrarian land around the city. There were no such thing as suburbs back then, right? You were either in the city or you were in the country. And if if your city got conquered by an empire, you are now even if you don't live in the city but you just live in the surrounding hinterlands, you are now under the government of that empire. Uh, and so uh, everything was in that sense kind of focused in on city life. The, all of the, the food that is grown in the hinterlands, the, the, uh, the wheat or, or even uh, the fish that are caught, for example, in the Sea of Galilee, the majority of what's grown or caught will go into the city. Uh, so if, if we're looking at Galilee in the first century, uh, it's all going into, say, uh, in, uh, Sepphoris. Uh, and then when Herod Antipas builds uh, a new city, Tiberias, now the, the people who are living in the hinterlands are finding themselves caught between two cities that their produce has to go to, the fish they catch in the sea or the... Uh, the wheat or the grapes or the figs that they grow on their land. Uh, this is what it means uh, for Rome to be an agrarian empire. It's, it's conquered these cities, it's included these cities in its empire. Uh, an agrarian, we should be clear, doesn't mean horticultural. Uh, a horticultural society uh, is still doing a lot of hunting and gathering, but they're also starting to grow some stuff. Uh, an agrarian society uh, is one where the majority of the income, the wealth, comes from the land in terms of, uh, of the, what's grown and what's caught. Uh, and you're talking more about farms uh, kind of being the basis of, 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 an, of the economy. Um, and, uh, and that Rome is an agrarian empire in, in that way. They conquer the cities, but, but the cities are only important insofar as they're the place where the elite live and the, um, the economic resources, the food, comes in from the land. Uh, and let me, let me say just a little bit more about that. Um, and, and I'm trying to be quick, and we're, we're really going over the time that we had set. But um, one of the models that's used by a New Testament scholar named John Dominic Crossan is a cross-cultural model by, uh, I believe he's a sociologist named Gerhard Linsky. He could be an anthropologist, but I think he's a sociologist named Gerhard Linsky. Uh, and uh, he looked at agrarian um, societies across cultures, across time, and found certain uh, characteristics uh, that you could map out. And basically, you'd find these characteristics in all agrarian societies. Uh, and we won't get into all of it, but he identified nine classes. Uh, so 
you know, we have this very simplistic view of our uh, economic uh, stratification in our culture and society. We have a upper class, middle class, working class. But actually, if you really start to study it, you find out that there's various classes. And that's true in agrarian societies also. Uh, there's the ruler uh, who would, uh, in the case of the Roman Empire, be the Roman emperor. Uh, and there's the governing class. Uh, this makes up 1% of the population, but uh, between the ruler and the governing class, so the people of his court, you might say, uh, they take in 50% of the economic income of the empire. 50% goes to the 1%. Uh, and um, then below them are the retainer class. These are uh, people who are skilled in reading and writing, the scribes. We, we often hear about the scribes in the Gospels and soldiers. Uh, not, not your grunt soldier, but um, the, the, what we might call generals and, and so on, the, the upper class soldiers. Uh, they make up um, about 5% of the population. Uh, and then there's two other classes that we might call the upper class, uh, and that would be the priestly class uh, and the merchant class. A merchant class is, is kind of variable. Uh, these come from the peasantry, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get a gauge on how large the merchant class is in any particular agrarian society, because it can change uh, so quickly. Uh, and one of the things uh, Ross mentioned, this is way before capitalism, and it is, uh, it's even before mercantilism, but what happens in modern uh, history is the kind of the rise of the merchant class uh, that, that ushers in these new forms of, of economic stratification like um, mercantilism and then eventually capitalism. But the majority of the population in the Roman Empire or any agrarian empire would be the peasantry. These are the people who lived on the land, they worked the land, the hinterlands. They, uh, these are the fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and um, they're the vast majority of the population. Uh, and they're often living, uh, you know, season to season. You know, are they, gonna, are they gonna grow enough to both pay their taxes and feed their family? Uh, is, is always the question on their mind. They're always worried about debt, in other words, and bread for the day. Are they going to have bread for the day, and are they going to be able to uh, escape falling into the trap of debt? So when we say the Lord's Prayer, we can hear some of that language even in there. You know, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forget our, forgive our debtors. Um, and then underneath the peasant class are those peasants who have lost their land uh, or developed a, uh, an artisanal skill. Uh, these are the artisans, the tradespeople. Uh, they can be more or less skilled. Uh, Jesus is of this class. He's a tectone or a builder. It doesn't seem like he's a particularly skilled artisan. Uh, so he's probably more towards the lower end of the artisanal class. Um, finally, there's the unclean class. Uh, these would be the lepers and such. Uh, and then at the very bottom, five to 10% five to of the population is the expendable class. Uh, these are, for example, in the Roman Empire, the infants, the unwanted infants that were left out to die. Uh, which was a practice in the Roman Empire, or the slaves. Uh, their death would, is, is not going to, uh, you know, cause most people too much uh, worry or, or, or um, they won't lose much sleep over it. And it's, it's a... Um, testimony to sin that every society has an expendable class.
Um, so anyway, uh, I just wanted you to get a sense of the stratification of the Roman world. And finally, to, to offer one more piece of this, and that is uh, Crossan draws on the work of another guy named John Kautsky, another sociologist or anthropologist named John Kautsky, who says that when you look at the Roman Empire, it's actually a commercializing agrarian empire, which means that they're actively involved in agribusiness. They're trying, the, the ruling class are trying to uh, get a hold of the peasant's land uh, by lending them money with the hope that the peasants will fall into debt and then they can foreclose on their land uh, and add it to large agribusiness plantations. Uh, and then often rehire the same peasant whose land that they just took as the steward of the land. And so we, we often hear in Jesus's parables uh, a lot of talk about stewards. And these are, these are often peasants who have lost their land and, but then been hired back to work the land that used to be theirs. Uh, and there's always this tension uh, then between these classes, this upper class that's taking so much from the, from the poor peasantry, and then the peasants who are always worried that they're going to slip down to the next level of society, slip to being a dispossessed artisan, or maybe even down to uh, the unclean and the expendable classes where the, the bandits and the beggars uh, exist. Uh, and so there's this tension that runs through, I think, a lot of the New Testament also. Because the New Testament, even though it's a, a spiritual document, a religious document, it speaks to our real lives. Uh, it did so for the first century. It does so in our century also. I'm sorry, I, I went on way too long. <laughs> but uh, Ross, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we close? No, no, but I think that's, uh, that'll do it for this, <laughs> this session. <laughs> yeah. It's been we, fun. I'm looking forward to this series and um, uh, I'm really pleased to have a chance to participate with you. Oh, I, well, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I hope you all recognize as you watch these videos, uh, what, what, uh, what a great honor it is to have uh, Ross, who actually teaches this stuff for a living, uh, do it for free for us. Uh, and uh, I'm just so happy to, to be able to do this with you, Ross. So thank you so much. Thank you.